according to my clock, we still have about um, two minutes left, but whoever comes in late will just have to make up for it. Um, as you can see, today's talk is entitled, I honorably assure you it's secure hacking in the Far East. Now, before we get started on that topic, there's one thing we have to get out of the way. And in case you've heard me talking before, you know what's coming next. Because unless I tell you who I am, you will not want to really hear what I, what I have to say. But if I take too long to tell you who I am, you won't be interested in it anyway. So here's my introduction in 60 seconds or less. Hello, my name is, and I am a professional that, as evidenced by all of this stuff. I live in, but I work and travel all over where I enjoy the massive English that only Asia can come up with. And I also massively enjoy always finding new uh, comparisons to describe the current state of the security community. If there's anything else you would like to know, just ask after the speech or over lunch, wherever you want, or if you're feeling stalkerish, you can check out observe.de, which is where I keep uh, links to most of the papers, most of the slides, um, just in case you miss one. So before we begin, when I, when I designed this speech, I did not quite expect how the situation in, in Eastern Asia would evolve over the last couple of weeks. So there is this weird thing going on right now where even though Eastern Asian countries share up to 80% of their culture and their, their writing and lots of their language, there's a lot of hate going on over issues that really have nothing to do with what they're supposed to be. Um, now, from a foreigner's perspective, and I'm not going to take a stance on this, but from a foreigner's perspective, it looks like everyone involved has gone crazy. So, whenever, if there's anything, and I don't know who's, where, what country you're from if you're in the room, I don't know what country you're from if you're watching this on the video later on, or if you're reading about this or just looking at the slides, if anything of, if any of the things I'm going to say is going to offend you, then please be offended by the ignorant white guy. Don't be offended by any country you attribute myself to. So in a nutshell, please, way less of this and way more of that. Because I think we can all agree that that's really cool Asian stuff. Well then, we're going to start off here with one of the basic concepts in, in Eastern Asia. And I'm going to call it by its Japanese name, but there's a similar concept in Confucianism. Um, it's called the Three Wise Monkeys. Now, what do they do? The pictures kind of make it clear. The Three Wise Monkeys is a philosophical approach of how you should live your life. Namely, you should see no evil, you should hear no evil, and you should speak no evil. Now, even though the light is shining in my face, I can kind of see that some of you are wondering, okay, why the fuck is this guy talking about philosophy in a hacking talk? Well, because it makes it kind of interesting to hack in Japan, because people will do whatever they can to ignore you. Let me give you an example. This is a picture I took a few weeks back in a big public park in Tokyo. As you can see in the background, no one cares. So even though there's five guys dressed up as Power Rangers performing all the moves, people don't ask them what they're doing, people don't go away, people just pretend they're not there. Following the I don't see anything and if I don't tell anything or hear anything, it's going to go away on its own. So, one of the results is that unless you force people to acknowledge what you're doing, they're just trying to, going to try to ignore you, whether that is hacking or pen testing or just being weird. So a couple of years back, as you may notice by lack of beard, I took a friend aside and we tried to find out just where the limit to that phenomena is. So we really want to figure out how far can we go in public in Japan with hacking before someone would intervene. So this is a Starbucks in Tokyo. And it's a normal laptop and my normal suit back then. And um, unfortunately, you can't really see the monitor right now. It was running Wireshark, wildly running through stuff, not because it was really important, but because that comes closest to what most people who have seen the Matrix movies think hacking is all about, right? Lots of scary characters flashing by your screen. So sitting in a public cafe running Wireshark probably won't get you any issues either in Europe or in the States either. But so we, we took this and we kind of upped it a little notch. Now, I'm not sure how good the resolution is. The t-shirt says, I read your email. Still, no one really reacted, so we added the sunglasses. And since that didn't do it, we replaced the small black ThinkPad with a huge silver ThinkPad with an Elite sticker on it. 
And since that didn't get any reaction either, we then added a 23 decibel omnidirectional antenna, <laughs> connected by a coax cable into a PCMCIA card. Now, the more security savvy among you may notice a couple of indicators that something bad is going on in this picture. You know, like the sunglasses, the shirt, the laptop, and the antenna. But we kind of figured, okay, these people are Japanese, right? They may not be able to read the English hint we left them, and maybe some of the symbols just don't work the same way around here. So luckily, there's some really great stores in Japan that will print whatever you want in a t-shirt. So we made this. This says hacker in Japanese. And after we sat there wearing this and taking a couple of pictures with this sh shirt on about three minutes in, finally a Starbucks staff employee walks up to us and he goes, if we translate it into English, well, I, I humbly apologize, but you know, I must ask you to kind of leave. And we were thrilled, right? We're like, done it. We have found the border. We have found how far we can go in Japan before they kick us out. Yeah, the only problem is the reason we got kicked out had nothing to do with all of this stuff that i just shown you. The reason we got kicked out of Starbucks, I'm not making this up, is it's not allowed to take pictures in Starbucks. <laughs> so I'm not sure where the boundary is. I haven't found it yet. And I've been working in Japan for a really long time, but there doesn't seem to be one. Now, for every element I'm going to point out to you today. After this, we're going to look at an exploitation vector because that's what makes it interesting. So for this particular exploitation vector, if you're going to um, start doing pen tests in Japan on Japanese companies, or if you're a black hat guy, if you're just going to run attacks in Japan, you can basically screw all of your covertness because no one is going to care anyway. Just make sure you're not on camera. But people on the street are not going to interfere. For all they care, you can have a cable going into the hotel's PBX system. They won't stop you. Still, right, so you're sitting there and people won't stop you, but you still have this feeling that they can still kind of see you, right? So that's uncomfortable. So it would be really nice if we had one of these. And historical evidence abounds that they used to be very popular in, in Japan and all over Asia. Um, and, you know, they're even more popular today. You can see them in movies. Uh, apparently, there's a huge market around them because you can also buy them on Amazon. For only 400 bucks, dude, that sounds like a good deal. Unfortunately, as, as further review revealed, they don't seem to be very effective. <laughs> so what if I told you that as long as you stay within Japan, there is actually a, a cloaking device that will make you absolutely invisible to ticket gate people, police, um, people who may talk to you for social violations, auditors, home security, there is one. You can buy it. You can buy it anywhere in the world. Here's mine. If you put on a suit in Japan, you basically become invisible. And when I say invisible, let me give you some numbers for this. So badge requirements, corporate badges, going in anywhere, conference badges, anything like that, no one is going to ask you. Security will not stop you if you're the guy wearing the suit. If they do stop you, come back 30 minutes later, pull out a cell phone, and talk really loud in English. And suddenly, you're too scary for anyone to approach. Um, in my personal case, it reduced the number of random police ID checks from once a month to never. So in Japan, police is actually allowed, if you're a foreigner, to check for your foreign registration ID. And it's usually quick, a quick process, but it still keeps bothering you. Um, and virtually, that's to get away with any social violation you want. So if you ever wanted to you know, stand in a public place and scream loudly, then wear a suit. This also works in South Korea, interestingly, but it kind of works differently in South Korea. When you go to South Korea, the suit will really affect you as well. However, I wouldn't really call it the, inv the invisibility cloak. I would call it the honor cloak. Because what it does is suddenly, and this is mostly for males, for girls this doesn't particularly work, but Foreign girls don't really have an issue in Korea to begin with. Um, people in restaurants will give, start giving you service. And when I say service, I mean anything that goes beyond huh and huh. It will also lead to the natives being about tr thrice as, men, as much willing to try to communicate with you in any language they may be able to speak instead of you know, screaming for the next person to come to the counter at Starbucks. Um, strangers will take you to locations and carry your stuff. 
Now, this sounds scary, but this has happened to me literally every time I visited Korea in a suit. So what happens is if you walk outside and you wear a T-shirt and you go, yeah, I don't know where this is, can you help me? People have this tendency to do the monkeys and just turn around and walk away. If you wear a suit, they will take you there because they can't explain it to you. So they just literally take your hand and they'll walk you wherever it is. The other thing that happened repeatedly is that, you know, you're standing at the airport and you have, these, you have a, a stairway and you have your suitcase, you know, leave one downstairs because you can't really carry everything at once and some random guy will just walk up, take your suitcase, carry it, say, you know, have a nice day and walk off. This has never happened without a suit. It will happen with a suit. The, the last thing, or the second to last thing is that you can actually get a taxi as a single foreign white male. If you're not wearing a suit, this may take up to 20 minutes. And what's really weird is that the taxi drivers will actually drop you off where you want to go. Now, some of your faces are saying, yeah, but that's kind of the purpose of a taxi. In South Korea, at least in Seoul, what happens if you're a foreigner is they won't take you where you want to go. They'll take you to a near intersection that they see fit and they'll kick you out. Because, and I quote, I'm not racist, but you're a foreigner and I'm just not quite sure what you're going to do. So in short, if you wear, whether or not you wear a suit in, in Korea, for as, as a male, it seems like you're in a completely different uh, country compared to not just wearing your civil clothing. Now, we've seen that we have these weird effects when we go to Korea and Japan with suits, but why is it? So there's two things in play here. Number one is the swarm effect, which basically is it's something common in every animal, humans included, which means if something looks like me and if I don't stand out of the group, I'm going to be integrated and people are just going to forget about me and they're going to be nicer because I look like them. Now, here's what a typical morning commute looks like in Japan. Notice a pattern. And here's the same thing in Korea, which is a church session, again, suits. So you wear a suit, you're showing off your integration. You can't really wear the traditional clothing because no one wears those anymore, you're going to stick out even more. But if you wear a suit, you look like everyone else, you're not threatening. But the even more important thing is the class effect. Now, this is not, as it may seem, about classes like, you know, lower class, middle class, upper class, yeah, forget about that. Um, for the, from the perspective of Eastern Asians, from what I've seen, there's three classes of foreigners. There's military people, it's class one. Now, if you're grouped in military because of anything, if, you know, you're a big guy, you look like a military guy, or you talk like a military guy, basically you're screwed. Because military is scary. And all the newspapers, for some reason, gang up to say, you know, if, if a military guy in Roppongi Hills throws up and beats someone, you can be sure it's going to be in the newspaper the next day. So if you're grouped in the military, you're scary, you're kind of shady, and no country in the world really likes a foreign military on its ground, no matter what we pretend or no matter how practical it may be at the moment. Um, the second category, in a nutshell, are English teachers. And when I say English teachers, it could be any kind of other foreign language. It could be a French teacher if you're from France. Um, the, in, if you fall in there, you're not going to be scary. You're going to be okay. The problem is that from the perspective of natives, you're some dude, and they're usually in their mid, tw mid to late 20s or early 30s, you're some guy in that age range whose only major life accomplishment up to this point has been to master its native tongue. So you're not particularly considered a good match for any specific occasion. And the last of the three categories is business. Now, when I say business, I don't mean people who actually do business. I mean people who are either skilled workers or, you know, who have money or in any way, people who are involved with actual work that requires some sort of skill or some sort of investment. And you really want to fall into that group. Why? Well, first off, you ha you're not really scary. Um, there's not many negative stories told about you. There's no banker scare going on in East Asia at the moment. Um, the other thing is that once you, if you're not negatively impacted by a stereotype, you're very likely to be impacted positively by a lot of other stereotypes. So basically, once you get the negative stereotypes out of the way, you get access to this huge pool of positive stereotypes, especially if you're European because if you, or American. Because every movie that's out there, all of the movies, all of the cartoons, all of the sitcoms that they import, they have these cool white people going around, right? So if you, if you manage to fall in there, you're good. People will be really friendly. You also kind of fall into that category over there. By the way, the suits trick, it also works in Hong Kong. Um, you just look like another banker and no one cares what you do because there's bankers everywhere. Now, how do we exploit that? Um, it's actually kind of straightforward. You do it like this. 
And if even though you're wearing the suit and you're talking in loud English and you're abusing everything I've shown you so far, if all of that fails, then you use the so-called dumb foreigner card. Here's how it works. I'm going to explain it to you by example. I, I, I took a trip down to Osaka a couple of years back with a buddy of mine, and we, we took the Shinkansen, which is a super express train, and it's really, really expensive. It's like 200 bucks one way. And we got, you know, you get one ticket for going, you get another ticket for coming back, and I was, you know, sleepy, so I inadvertently invalidated my, my return ticket. So what happened? Well, we figured that out when we tried to leave, so I got my buddy, who was a native Japanese person, walk up to the, gate, to the, to the uh, ticket counter and say, yeah, you see, my friend over here, um, he was sleepy, so he invalidated his ticket, and now he can't use it anymore, and could you please give us a new one? And their answer was, well, we could do that, but it's going to take us about 24 hours to verify whether that's true, right? We're going to go to the gate, and we're going to see if his old ticket is in there, and so on, and so on, and so on. <coughs> so we didn't have that time. So we, he, I just asked him to go to another one and try something else. So he walks up to a different ticket counter, and he goes, well, you see, I have this friend, and my friend is kind of this foreign idiot. And being the foreign idiot that he is, he, he just lost his return ticket. And their reply was, yeah, that's no problem. Here's a new one. <laughs> We're going to come back to this in a bit because it, it, it's really, it, this is your last line of defense. So what we're going to look at next is home insecurity. Why that? Well, I have this basic approach that if anyone has access to your home, your work machine, your server, or your fridge, you're screwed. So if you look at home security in Japan, you basically look at two different categories of homes. You have the apartment category over here. Um, and you have the mansion category. Now, apartment and mansion don't really mean what they mean to Western people or even other Asian people. Um, an apartment is basically a cheap, uh, in, in terms of rent and construction, apartment, um, mostly built out of wood and paper, and they're not guaranteed to withstand a strong airport, um, earthquake. Um, to the contrary, you actually sign a clause that if an earthquake above uh, level or magnitude six should strike, that you acknowledge that this building will actually collapse. So they're a cheap form of living. Um, and if you want to know about security, there, there is no security. Um, I mean, so this is how your window is locked, which, you know, it's isolated with rubber, so you can just push a coat hanger through there and open it without damaging it. But it doesn't really matter because this is the window, and if you have a rock, you can just throw it in in a second anyway. Um, and if you look around, well, then there's some hope over here. So this window is obviously um, closed off with a rail, which, which is very nice. Um, it brings up the question of why they took the least accessible and smallest window in the entire apartment to wire it up instead of, let's say, this big one. Um, I figure it's so they won't ruin my view of the other apartment that's five cent, 50 centimeters away. But there's a bit much bigger problem here. So we've seen the, the wired window. Now let's take a closer look. Can anyone spot a flaw in the security design? Yeah, so let me introduce you to my, my new elite hacking tool. It's this one. Um, and yes, you can take it off. You, know, you, got your, you got a door lock on that one. It's, it's fairly standard. You got a key like that. It takes about a minute to pick. Not that I tried, because that would be illegal. <coughs> but one thing to give you some confidence is that your rental agreement will always have a clause like this one, which says, yeah, you know what, uh, to prevent crime, we've actually tagged these keys, and no locksmith is allowed to make a copy. So if you look at it, you go, wow, you know, that's actually kind of nice, because now only really hardcore criminals will have the access to the technology to copy the keys. Now, unfortunately, any of the stores I tried, none really cared. So you just walk in and you go, hey, I would like a copy of this key. And the guy at the counter will ask you, sir, are you aware that this key is copy protected? And you say, yes, I am. He says, OK. <laughs> now let's move on to the mansion type. And the mansion type, point one, you'll need to set at least one of your kidneys to afford it. Um, they're sturdily constructed. They're earthquake resistant. They're actually based on a model of basically a giant frying pan in the ground on which the actual building stands. Um, they're centrally locked, and they often come with security services. Now, on the first view, these are really nice from a security perspective because, for example, here's a key. It's a bump key. It's my current place, so I'm not going to show you the full bump. Um, you have a security system installed. This actually links to a central 
um, company that su surveils your apartment, a couple of sensors, and they'll come. You have also have alarm buttons on there to call them directly. Uh, you have double locks, and the doors are actually metal and forced, so you can't easily kick them in. And you have the central lock downstairs, so no one can camp outside of your door either. And these locks actually um, are, use some sort of NFC, and I've tried to look into it today, but we couldn't get a reading out of them. But either way, they're, they're touch enabled. So, you know, we're finally safe. Well, not quite, because behind my apartment, I'm not quite sure if you can see this because the lights are kind of weird, there's this fence to protect the back entrance. Oh, excuse me, let me correct myself. There's this fence to correct the back entrance. So the fence has this height, and there's a, a stepping stone about this height right next to it, so you're not going to have to jump. You can basically quite comfortably walk over it. And then once you've walked over it, oh, by the way, it has the same high security lock in there, so you can't just open it, but you'll, you know, if you walk over it, you take two steps and you get to the bicycle entrance, which does not happen to be locked. So, yeah, we're screwed again. This is the, the home security system in itself, and this one is interesting because, like everything in Japan, including the toilets, this thing can be programmed. Now, if you're a dumb foreigner like me, this can be quite a challenge. And here's what happened. I moved into this apartment, and I saw this, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. I'll have something to play with tomorrow. I'm not, you know, I'm not awake enough to do it today, but I'll look at this thing tomorrow. So what I didn't know is that the guy who lived in the apartment before me had programmed this thing. And the management company did not find it, you know, required action to reset it to standard factory settings. So the guy who lived there before me had this really, really brilliant idea. He had this idea that if it's after 1 a.m. and your lights have been out for more than 20 minutes and your doors are locked, you're obviously either asleep or you're gone. So if anyone at that point should try to open the, the uh, balcony door, that must obviously be an, you know, an attacker or a kidnapper or whatever. So the alarm system was set to uh, basically dispatch the SWAT team to my apartment without verification. If the door should be open after 1 a.m., you know, and my lights would have been out for, for more than 20 minutes. Now, you know, no normal person would do that unless, of course, you're a 20-something white guy who just moved into Tokyo after a couple of years and decided, wow, it's such a lovely night. I want to have a drink out there overlooking the beautiful scenery. And I open the door, the alarm system goes off with a metallical Japanese voice going, Pre uh, intrusion prevention system activated. Intrusion prevention system activated. 20 seconds later, my cell phone rings. And there's a male voice going, yes, sir, someone is breaking into your apartment. We've just dispatched a SWAT team. Okay, so I tell him, you know, dude, that was me. You know, I, I, I missed it, I opened the door, it's me, you can trust me. And he goes, no, 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 we can't do that because, you know, what, what if there's a kidnapper in your home and he's holding a gun to your head, right, and, and he's forcing you to say this, so we have to come. You know, and I appreciate that because that's obviously the right thing to do. That said, it's 3 a.m. in the morning, I have to go to work the next day, and I don't really feel like having a SWAT team searching my apartment for a hidden intruder. So I bust out the dumb foreigner card. I, st I stopped trying to explain to him why I could, you know, why it was no one just go, do it, do it, do it. I, okay, look, look, let, 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 let me talk to you directly here. I'm German. I, I just, yeah, I just didn't know. So we had this five second pause after which the guy on the other side of the telephone goes, oh, well done, sir, yeah, we'll call him back. So also, if you're a kidnapper and you ever want to get rid of them, just pretend you're German, apparently it works. And no matter if you live in an apartment or a mansion, one of the other central parts you're going to run into is this thing. It's a, it's a, mail, it's a, it's a mailbox. Now, these are actually kind of cool. They're, they're uh, number combination locks. They're rotation locks uh, with 10 digits each. Now, we're going to look at how you can basically if, uh, reduce the efficiency of a lock to zero in only four steps. Because if we look at the lock in itself, right, we have an entropy of about 20 by the potency of eight. How do I come up with this number? Well, we have 20 numbers we can select, right turn, left turn, 10 digits, and an average person obviously can remember a phone number, which is eight digits, so this is a conservative guess. Of course, if you want, you can remember much longer combinations. Now, here's what Japan, and, you know, 20 by the potency of eight, good luck, you know, cracking that lock. You probably have much better chance just breaking it open. So the, the country of Japan made some really, really smart decisions to, to, to address this obvious problem of a secure lock. Number one, it's legally prohibited for any lock, uh, for any rotation lock on a mailbox of more than three digits. 
All right, well, we're, we still have an entropy of 20 by 3. Um, number two, legally force all locks to open in a clockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise pattern. All right, we're still at 1,000. And number three, which kind of kills it, is legally force the first two digits of the combination to be the same. <laughs> now, those of you who are good with math may have figured that we're at this point down to 100 combinations. Now, the fourth part is actually not the government's fault, it's the fault of people who built these locks. There's no crank that you have to activate or no button, no button to push. So if you just pull on the lock and try, at some point, the mailbox is just going to pop open if you apply the right amount of pressure. So I ran some checks, and to do a full rotation, it takes about 1.5 seconds to try a combination. So you do a full rotation, you rotate to one digit. So if we do a little math, we end up with a 50% unlock chance in 75 seconds and a 100% unlock chance in 150 seconds. But this is actually not the worst part. So there's a fairly large um, monthly apartment rental company in Tokyo, which shall remain unnamed for this purpose, that I've had the pleasure of living with twice, several years apart. Now, I'm the weird kind of person who remembers codes for, for old credit cards and phone numbers that I used 10 years ago. So I still remember my, my, my lock key for my mailbox. And I moved in there again early this year for a couple of months. And I found it very curious that my mailbox in a completely different area of town had the exact same code. So, but I figured, you know, there's only 100 combinations, so the collision chance is actually quite rational. So I asked the, the, the land, well, the, the real estate agent lady, and she told me that, well, no, no, that's, that's not coincidence. Um, all of our mailboxes have the same code. <laughs> when I asked her if, if she doesn't consider that that may be a bad idea, her answer was, and I quote, yeah, but you know, who, who would try that? <laughs> Not me, that's for sure. Let's jump for Korea for a second. So we've seen um, the, the mail locks in Japan. We're going to take a look at, at common locks in Korea for a second. Not necessarily mail. They look like this. They're pin code locks. Um, they're installed into your door. And of course, if you look at it, um, again, assuming that a person can remember a phone number, we get an entropy of 10 by the potency of 8, which is really high. Um, problem is that even though it's not a law, most of these locks only take four digits. So if you look at the manufacturers, most of them um, don't go above that number, so we get an entropy of 10,000. And the real problem is that the vast majority of them are not wired to anything. There's actually a small battery inside that you can exchange from inside your apartment that powers the lock. Um, and they also don't really block you out after numerous attempts, or it's a very short blockout, because of course if the lock locks down for an hour, then a lot of kids in the neighborhood are going to have a really good time trolling you by just running around, punching random numbers into every door they find, and then when you come home, you, your lock tells you, yeah, yeah, please try again in 48 hours. Um, <laughs> so obviously they can't do that. So uh, again, I ran some tests, and the average um, amount of time it takes to check out one combination is about 0 0.85 seconds um, over a span of 120. So again, if you do some math, we have a 50% unlock chance for 60, um, in 66 minutes, yeah, 100% unlock chance, a little over two hours. Now, if this was a mailbox, I'd say that's adequate, but this is your apartment, right? This is where you keep your passport, this is where you keep all of your important stuff, all of your tech, your money, if you, have, if you store it at home. So, in, in that context, two hours to crack the lock without any sign is not a good idea. Now, of course, the, the fact that the lock is a battery case on the other side kind of gives you an impression of just how sturdy those doors are, so if you run out of time, just kick it in. But there's actually a way more interesting vector here to, to piss people off if you're into that, which you can see up here. I'm not sure, the slides are pretty bad, uh, the resolution, but it says emergency power DC 9 volt. So obviously, if your battery is inside the apartment and your battery runs out of power, you won't be able to open your door even if you know the code, right? So there's this brilliant method that you can just take a 9-volt battery you buy somewhere else and you hold it up to these two pins up there and then the lock will draw power from the battery. What that tells us, however, is that those two pins go directly into the circuitry of that lock. So if you want to have a really good time and make a really bad time for a lot of people, you get yourself a couple of these locks, a high amperage car battery, and you just blow them out. Now, how do you counter-exploit that? Because, you know, exploitation, obviously, is you know, I just talked about. So for counter-exploitation, if, if, if you're having an apartment in one of these two countries, you basically better assume that if someone wants to get into your apartment, they will. Now, this is true for all over the world, right? If you have enough resources and power, you can get into an apartment wherever you go, but it's particularly easy here. 
We're going to move on to probably one of the most fun parts of this, at least if you like stories that make your hair stand up. Uh, we're going to talk about corporate and security, which means the reason why companies that you work for or that you may consult for or that you may test in, in, in either country are not really all that up to speed and have all those weird security flaws, we're not quite sure how they could have happened. And any security flaw you'll, you'll find, and this is also applicable to Korea, but this is mostly for Japan, anything you'll find, you have to look at two, two filters, two conceptual filters. Number one is lifetime employment. What on earth is lifetime employment? Well, it basically means that a company hires you fresh out of university and they guarantee you a mediocre wage. It's not bad, it's not really good, it's a mediocre wage. They guarantee you mediocre raises of anywhere between three and five percent a year. Um, and you cannot be fired or laid off. The company is not legally allowed to. There are legal instruments that exist. You couldn't make this contract in Europe, for example, but you can do it in Japan. Um, if you survive until your retirement, until you die, they'll pay you 75% of your last wage, and if you die, your, your spouse is going to get the same amount of money until they die. So, you know, while it may not be an appealing model to the hacker community where we do everything ourselves and we want to live our lives, for people who just want to run a family, this is an incredibly appealing model, and people who run pen tests often forget this motivation base behind them. The other concept to look at is bonuses. Now, in most countries, there's some form of bonus, but it's usually either a couple of hundred dollars or, you know, a month wage. What we have in Japan is that it's up to 50% of your annual, annual wage. When I say 50%, your bonus may be 12 months of your wage. So if you get your bonus, you double. If you don't get your bonus, you may not be able to pay your bills. Um, officially, this is made to reward good work. Unofficially, it usually depends on who does the most overtime. And it's, it's really a tool to keep employees in line because if you want to change something, right, you always run the threat of you, might, you, know, you may not get your bonus because even though we usually pay this to people every year, we, it's not guaranteed to you in, in your contract. Um, so the entire thought process of an average worker, it doesn't matter often if it's an engineer or middle management or even upper management in a Japanese company, boils down to don't fuck up. And when I say don't fuck up, Fuck up is a do word. It requires action. As long as you remain passive, you cannot be blamed. This, is, this sounds weird from an outsider's perspective, so let's look at an example. If you make, okay, you have, you're working on a project, right? And you make a judgment call because you see the situation, it's just totally clear, and there's a protocol in place, but the protocol is not particularly well defined, it was defined 20 years ago, and you figure, wow, if we just did it this way, we could change this, you know, we could save this company millions. But something goes wrong, something you didn't predict, you know, maybe the country that you tried to do business with had a military putsch, something like that, and your company incurs a small loss. And when I say small loss, this could be, a, you know, 10 bucks, it's, it's enough. Yeah, you screwed up. Your bonus is gone. Forget about it. You're not going to get it. You may get fired for it because obviously you have the audacity to act against the company. Now, on the other hand, if you pedantically stick to protocol, even though it's completely wrong, it's completely obvious that it's wrong, and the company loses millions over this because you don't, you know, you refuse to budge because this is how you do it. No matter, as long as the company doesn't go bankrupt over it, and this is kind of hard to do in Japan because most of companies are subsidized by the government, your promotion will be secured. It doesn't matter how badly you screw up from a human perspective, as long as you don't do anything to screw up, you will get promoted and you will get your, your bonus and you will get all your stuff handed out to you so you get. So in a nutshell, you don't, you know, don't work too fast, stay until 1 a.m. and secure that bonus, or you, know, you can become a contractor, but then you're kind of an outcast. So let me give you an example of how this actually plays out. Um, in example A, I'm going to run you guys through a fictional penetration test of a fictional company, not that this had ever happened to me in person, and I just want to get your feedback on how you would react. So you go in, and you fire up Nmap, and you run it against the customer's network, and um, you, you find a Windows NT4 box that runs IRC on, on port 31337. Now, here, here's the million dollar question. How would you react? I know this may be presumptuous, but I would assume the frickin' box is owned for, you know, just call it intuition. So I told the client that I never worked for um, the same thing, and their response was, well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll check into it. Now, that seems like a very serious issue. We acknowledge that IRC should not be running on a Windows NT4 box in our corporate network. This was on the intranet, by the way, and taking, uh, dialing out to other IRC servers to get commands. Um, we'll check into it, and, you know, two weeks pass, and 
nothing really happened. So I decided to kind of poke them about it and go, so you know, that IRC box, the, the Windows NT4 box with IRC running, whatever happened to that one? Here's the reply in verbatim with emotion added to express my feeling at the points where I heard it. We, haven't, we have decided against shutting down or altering the affected machine because the guy who set it up no longer works here. And we have no idea what it does. But it might be important, so we'll just leave it running. <laughs> now, can any of you spot a flaw in this approach? But as flawed as it may look from the outside, from a, from a checklist of the engineers who are working on it, it goes like, okay, I didn't touch it. It's not obviously horribly broken from a middle management POV. Okay, obviously horribly broken from middle management POV means it's not on fire. And when I say it's not on fire, I mean it's not physically burning. Yes. We tested your application and it works perfectly. Here are the logs for your su successful test run. We received the data. It was because you did not uh, call the API within 24 hours. So. Um, since just telling them wasn't enough, we set up a full-blown meeting with middle management and we met them and we talked it over and then they requested that they have some time to talk about it among each other, which seemed fair enough. Um, so three days later, the engineers reached out to us to confirm that we're absolutely certain that it's not the SSL certificate and we confirmed it. Uh, two days later, middle management reached out to us to confirm that we're absolutely certain and this time we should be really certain that it's not the SSL certificate and we confirmed it. And a few days later, upper management reached out to us to confirm that it's absolutely certainly not the SSL certificate, and we confirmed it again. And to make sure, one important point is this company um, was, not a pro it was owned by a different company, so even upper management would be sticking their neck out if they're doing something wrong here. Um, and after this, they basically requested some more time to think it over among themselves, and then we never heard of them again. How do you solve this? Well, I can tell you how I solved it. Two months in, months in red, uh, and we, we tried to reach out to them repeatedly and nothing really happened. They didn't even reply to us at some point. So two months in, I suggested to developers that just remove the freaking entry number 22 that says it may be your SSL certificate and then call the company and tell them, yeah, we fixed it. Don't tell them what you did. Don't tell them there was an error. Just say, we fixed it. And what happened? Well, the product was launched within 24 hours after that. So again, if you look at it from a, from a normal employee's checklist, it makes perfect sense again. So it says maybe the certificate, so if I, you know, if I say it's not and we lodge it, anything else goes wrong, I'm still gonna be penalized for it. Um, so don't put your neck out, no one else puts their neck out either. The entire operation is delayed by two months and it literally cost that particular company thou hundreds of thousands of dollars um, until at some point the client, which is the, person I was, the company I was consulting for, took the responsibility by saying we fixed it and the error didn't show up anymore. So whatever happens from now on, I get to keep my job. So how do we exploit that if we run pen tests in, in, in Japan? Um, well, number one, you can assume that stuff won't be fixed. So if, 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 you, if you find it weird to find NT4 servers running obscure services, then you've obviously not done very many pen tests in Eastern Asia because it's extremely common. Because what usually happens is someone sets them up and they wor start working somewhere else and you know, no one knows what the box does and no one wants to touch it because something bad may happen and then you did the bad thing and then you're fired. And number two is, if you can create a responsibility setting, then no one will disturb you. Now, a responsibility setting is something like this. Um, you know, you, you're running a pen test, someone walks up to you, goes, you know, what are you doing here? And you go, well, I'm here on behalf of, and this is your intel you gathered before, find the name of some middle manager or upper manager, anyone who outranks anyone in the building at the moment that cannot be reached because they're on vacation. Will you be responsible when he finds out that you disturbed me? I've never been talked to after that sentence. Let's jump to wireless for a second. So, have any of you been war driving recently in a European city or an American city and you've seen all of those lovely WPA2 secured hotspots and you remember the good old days where you would find open hotspots everywhere belonging to private people who couldn't configure their router? Well, the, the good old days are well and alive in, in Tokyo. This is a recent screenshot. So, uh, at a random place, we see that two of them are open, three of them are using WAP, and only two of them are using uh, WPA, one of them WPA2. This is not really the worst part yet. The worst part, if you really look at it, are these guys. So these are the three major Japanese mobile carriers, SoftBank, IAU by KDDI, and NTT Docomo. 
And these guys have serious issues with their traffic because data, um, mobile traffic has just completely exploded over the last couple of years. So what they did is they came up with a fairly interesting system where they just set up Wi-Fi hotspots, standard 802.11 Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, and your cell phone, if it runs by with one, of the, uh, with one of these companies, will automatically detect the hotspot if it's nearby and automatically sign you in. So if you walk by, if you use a SoftBank phone and you sit in a cafe that has a SoftBank hotspot and it's most about all of them, um, your phone will automatically log in and it will sh shoot all of your data over that particular hotspot, saving the company lots of, of data traffic. Um, now, these will actually not actually allow you to connect with the computer. Well, they will allow you to connect, but they won't allow you to get through um, the router. Um, and they fix, they do that by filtering um, A, your MAC address, and B, the user agent that your machine sends when it very first connects to the, um, to the router. So as you can plainly see, this is absolutely secure, and, and no one could ever really break into that. And since SoftBank tried to, to sue the hell out of the last guy who revealed how exactly you break into them, I'm not going to tell you, but if you have a sniffer set up, it's going to take you about 20 seconds. But even when you look at this in Japan, Korea really takes the cake here because this is a screenshot from last year in Korea. Can anyone spot a problem? So if, if you go to Korea and you, you, you like using Skype, you don't really have to buy a data plan or a foreign SIM or roaming or anything. You just log into one of the hotspots available. And all of Seoul is covered by open hotspots belonging to some person. Now, exploitation vector, yeah, I, I, I don't really know what we could possibly do with anonymous public open internet access. Uh, I'll let you guys figure that one out. But while we're, while we're talking about Korea, I, I would like to, to ask a question to the room, and I'm taking all guesses here. What's the browser market share for Internet Explorer, all versions of it in Korea, South Korea, at this very moment? 83, 90? You, you, guys, you, you guys are close. You, you may know something. It's actually 97%. Let me spell that out for you. It's 97%. Here's a graph. Unfortunately, it stops in 2010. I couldn't find a newer one. Um, the, the thing that really creeped me out personally is if you look up here, the dark blue line is IE6. It's going up. <laughs> now, if you're anything like me, your face would probably look something like this. What on earth is going on in South Korea with browsers? Any ideas? All right. This is really funny because it's one of those things that's really big about Korea, but no one else ever looks into it. Um, SSL or TLS, whatever you want to look at it, it's universal, right? We use it in every country. Yeah, let me show you this map of the adaption of the SSL standard. Um, do you see the red spot? By the way, green means they use SSL. So the red spot is called South Korea. Uh, let me introduce SEED. SEED is an encryption algorithm uh, developed in 1988 by the Korean Information Security Agency. It's a 128-bit block cipher, and it was specific. It's, it's, it wasn't developed as, a, as an alternative to SSL. It, was actually, it actually predates SSL's public availability in many regions. So what they did is they basically spun off this entire new algorithm. Um, and up to, until this day, it's required for online banking, online shopping, government transactions, paying your taxes. Basically, any, any secure online communication you want to do with a Korean company, you have to use Seed. Now, Seed runs as an ActiveX plugin. So unless you're using Win, uh, some version of Windows and some version of Internet Explorer, you cannot use Seed. And your computer basically gets degraded for a toy to look at cats because you cannot uh, build an encrypted channel. Um, so Mozilla tried really hard to, to implement Seed. They did it. There's still some components that are missing that the government refuses to sign with their own keys. Um, so if you're in Korea, you will use Internet Explorer. And this also explains why IE6 is going up, because people were upgrading to, to Windows Vista or Windows 7 at some later points, and it had lots of complications, because of, of course, it's an ActiveX component. It's, it's, kind of, it's fairly sensitive to the, to the OS you're running, so people just switch back to XP. And since they already switched back, they figured, yeah, better not upgrade that browser, because it may break it again. And here are some of the effects that Seed is having. Um, number one is that there's a really, really slow adaption to new Windows versions, as we've already seen. Alternative browsers and OSs are basically useless. They're perceived as toys because you can't really do anything that's really working with them. Um, it's integrated with most cell phones. That's one of the cool things. So 
if, if, you know, if your cell phone has a unique ID and if you tell that to your bank, your cell phone is actually able to log into your bank account and it will do a two-factor authentication. Um, and the two-factor authentication is actually the, the kicker because many of the, of the communications that C does are two-factor. So the, the certificates on the user end are given out by the government. So if you, act, if you access a C-protected site, you become 100% traceable. So since you're 100% traceable, people don't really see the need to secure web applications because if you're going to hack it, they're going to know who you are anyway. But we're going to talk about this in, in a bit again. Um, in a nutshell, if you're, if you're talking about Korean security uh, or if you're, if you're planning to do a pen test over there, look into the RFCs for seed. Um, they're, they're very complex. It's not a bad algorithm at all. It's just an algorithm that no one ever uses anywhere outside of Korea, which completely replaces SSL within the country. This also means that if you're working with a Korean developer and they're writing something for you, don't expect them to know what, how SSL works because it's simply not relevant to their lives. Um, in, in this particular case, how do you exploit it? Well, thought. Um, next thing we're going to look at is, the, is what I like to call the two near field communication, which is um, kind of an international topic because if you look at it, these are just a couple of, of near field communication cards. Uh, the ma majority of those that are shown here are actually based on the on Sony's Felica um, model. Now, the Japanese have taken this concept of, of near field communications and they've taken it to another completely different level. Uh, and I would like to introduce you to what I think is the worst idea in human history. It's the NFC enabled Visa card. Now, this does not actually allow you to charge to your Visa, but your card has a preset limit that you can set to whatever you want. You can set it to 200 bucks. And whenever your card empties, it will automatically charge another 200 bucks to your, to your card and will recharge the. the, the, the uh, the payment card that's on it. In this case, it's the Suica card that's integrated. Um, now, if you, if you try to convince anyone anywhere else in the world to use a credit card that has NFC enabled, that bills directly to your credit card, people will look at you and go, are you fucking nuts? The reason why this works in Japan is because the same technology has already been around for years and it's been in integrated in, in cell phones. So these cell phones have NFC technology in it, something that we're just slowly seeing in, in other countries, and you can pay with them. And whatever you pay with them gets charged to your phone bill. So people are already really, really used to the concept of, yeah, yeah, I have this unlimited bill that I can, you know, use with NFC. It's just really practical because all I have to do is beep. So why is this a problem? Well, first, it's used virtually anywhere if you're in Japan. Um, there's a couple of stores where you can't even pay in cash anymore. They only take NFC. Um, a popular example are the trains. Um, if you want to get on the train, you have to buy a ticket. Uh, in many stations, only two of 10 ticket gates will have a real ticket slot. Everything else only takes NFC. So you're, you're basically bound to carry a Suica or a Felica, um, a Suica, a Pasmo, or an Eddy card around with you. Um, you have this automatic recharging, um, and it's ex actually accepted by a lot of online stores by now. Um, and you need to get a reader like this one. It's called the Felica reader. They, you can buy them on Amazon for about 10 bucks. Um, they come with drivers, really easy to install. And what, what the weird thing about the cards is that on the chip, they will store your last 20-something transactions. Now, this may be anything. This may be something you buy, or this may be you know, a train you get on, or it may be a train you get off. So if you have this reader and you plug into your PC and you, put, you get anyone's card in the near proximity of it, you can extract a view like this. Um, and this is actually not a hacker tool. This tool comes with the reader. Um, so by now, what do we have? We get someone's NF NFC data, his, his card or his cell phone, and we get location tracking, we get purchase tracking, um, which, which obviously leads to some problems down the road somewhere. Um, but what, what really makes it bad is that if you look at Amazon JP, you can see that you can actually pay with your Osaifu Keitai and Eddie card, and all you need is the exact same reader. So you plug in the reader, you go to Amazon, you say, yeah, I want to buy this. They go, okay, what do you want to pay with? I want to pay by NFC, cool. Put, you know, touch your car to the receiver attached to your computer, beep, and you've paid. Now, obviously, what we can do with it is we can buy stuff on other people's tabs, right? So you open Amazon up on your laptop, you have some sort of cellular connection, uh, you go to, to pay, you take your reader, you walk up to some guy, you do beep, because there's no authentication, and you've just paid for it. Now, I've taken a lot of crap for this particular point because people always bring up the same defense. They say, but Paul, the Felica standard, particularly 
specifies that to prevent this, we're only going to allow this across millimeters with private readers. So they, they can do centimeters with, with commercial readers, but as an individual, you can only get readers that allow you to read these cards from about two or three millimeters away. And you couldn't possibly get that close to another person without him noticing. That's just ridiculous. Um, now, anyone who believes this has obviously never taken the morning commute train in Tokyo. Because this is what it looks like, and this is not stage. This is fairly common. On, and this is a Tokyo Line train. It's a rapid commuter express. It only comes every 20 minutes, so if you miss it, you'll be late for work. And this is how they make sure that everyone gets on the train. So obviously the, pre the inside pressure is still too high, so they need to get some more people to help with the pushing. So anyone who wants to tell me that in this setting I couldn't possibly get within three millimeters of this guy's purse or wallet is trying to kid me. Yeah, we're almost done. If you want to really shoot it off, have an emergency flight the next morning and carry two suitcases and try to get in there. All right, I think we've confirmed that with, with this technology and a little bit of evil spirit, we can do location tracking, we can do purchase tracking, and we can buy stuff on other people's tabs by simply abusing the rush hour in the morning. Now, we got eight minutes left, and I'm going to use them. This timing should work out perfectly. Um, to, after I've shown you all of this cool stuff that we can do and all of these weird vectors, we're going to sum them up a little, and we're going to look at the top, what I like to call the top three hit list, um, which is basically the top three things I've seen in the last six years, seven years, um, that made me go, huh, and that I'm allowed to disclose because they're not under NDA anymore or because they never were to begin with. Um, number three is the most harmless. It's called airport security. Now, if you go to Narita Airport and you check in, you have to put your passport on a certain reader, which reads the chip inside, if it's already a chip-enabled passport, and will you know, check whether your, chip is, whether your passport is correctly signed, all of this stuff. So this is the machine. It's, it's very nice. It also checks you in if it finds you. Um, so this thing handles all of your passport data, right? So what, what I find slightly unnerving was watching it boot, because this came up. What I found more unnerving is that the very day I took that picture was the day where a, re, um, a zero day, a remote zero day, was published for XPSP2. So we, we know that the box was hackable at that particular point. Number two is what I like to call the ultra secure JavaScript, uh, which is a technology often employed in Japan. I've seen this a couple of times. This is just one example. Um, so this is a, a, a router. Um, you need to log in to use it. It's, it's a standard router. It was actually used as a pay router uh, in a cafe. So they said, you know what, if you want to use your internet, please enter your credit card details here. So I just figured out, well, I'm, I'm kind of bored. Uh, let's look at the source for this. Uh, here's the source. Can anyone spot a flaw? Let me give you a hint. It's this part of JavaScript that says var password. It gets worse, it's var password. If password equals this, then call the function send login. So the entire authentication was done in JavaScript. And this is a run-of-the-mill standard router produced by a huge Japanese manufacturer of routers. This is, this is not a fluke. This is, there are tens of thousands of these things deployed, and we all know how often router frameworks get updated. Um, but this is nothing compared to the grand finale. The grand finale is, um, happened while I was working for a Japanese company, consulting for them um, in, in the mix of development and security efforts. And they asked a Korean company for, to, you know, to provide them with a the software so the Korean company would develop it. So you know, they gave them the contract, and the Koreans looked at it, and they go, OK, we know how this works. So they develop it, and they send it back to us. Now, the client remembers that I have a security background and goes, yeah, you know what, can you, can you test this? You know, you know, we know you're busy, but just take you know, 20 minutes out of it. Just give it a rough look. So what I do is um, I go to the login prompt, I hit shift, and I hit the num row once, and I hit enter, and the server comes back with um, SQL query upper, upper quote cannot be found because malformatted query. So I'm like, okay, there may be something wrong here. 
Um, it turns out the thing is, is an absolute catastrophe. And when I say absolute catastrophe, uh, the, the damn vulnerable web app prototype kit that you practice your web attacks against would be considered secure against what, what these guys delivered. So uh, we, had, we had everything. We had RFI, we had LFI, we had XSS, we had SQL injection on the main page. SQL, was, like, SQL queries weren't filtered at all. Um, but my personal favorite was the fact that it stored credit card numbers in plain text in the database, and you could look at that from the admin interface. And the admin interface was secured with JavaScript. And by that I mean there was JavaScript that would check a cookie on your machine, and if the cookie was not set, by the way, the cookie had to be set to one, if the cookie was not set, it will call the JavaScript back function to send you back to the previous page. So obviously, if you just disabled freaking JavaScript, you could look at the admin panel and use it all you wanted because there was no other authentication going on. All the login prompt for the admin interface did was set this cookie to one. So obviously, we have some really, really big security issues with this thing. So the Japanese got this. I'm not going to reveal how I got them to accept that there may be security issues, but they sent it back to the Koreans. The Koreans look at it and they figure out that um, there are some issues. And of course, you know, it explodes with them and one developer gets fired because he should have known. He, he was supposed to be the foreign technology guy. Um, another issue was that they got an SSL warning because the certificate they were using simply did not match the domain name. So they got, a, they got a signed certificate, but it was not for the correct domain name. So of course, we got a huge warning for that. Um, but what happened after this is that the communication between the Korean company and the Japanese company exploded as well, because the Koreans ac accused the Japanese of being rude, and the Japanese accused the Koreans of being lazy. So we're back at where we are right now, basically. And you know, so to, to quiet it down, we got another consultant who was fluent in Korean, and we set up this huge meeting. And um, during the meeting, Basically, they, 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 they worked together to identify two sets of flaws. They identified the critical flaws, which had to be fixed before launching, and they identified the non-critical flaws, which had to be fixed, you know, whenever, at some point, when we're making money. Uh, so here's a list of the critical flaws. Um, users are not able to log in if the names contain special characters. By the way, that's because the special characters would cause the SQL query to fail. Um, the two quick session timeout was annoying to potential users, so it increased it from one hour to three. They disliked the colors, and this freaking SSL error kind of annoyed users, so they had to be fixed. And of course, the credit card numbers being stored in plain text in the database, that was bad. Now, they didn't really care about the, the security implications, but there's a law in Japan prohibit, uh, prohibiting that under very strict penalties, so you know, that obviously had to be fixed. Here's a list of the non-critical flaws. Um, SQL injection in the login form. 207 counts of XSS and the admin console being secured by JavaScript. And here's the quote I received from the, from the CEO of the Japanese company. He goes, we can launch with those. No one will check that. He went on to say that only weird people like me will check that. So anyway, you can see this, this thing is still live. And the Korean company has deployed the same prototype to about three dozen other clients. Um, but in the end, you know what? From what I've told you guys, we can at least be proud. They fixed SSL. Um, unfortunately, they didn't fix SSL. They fixed the error message, which was the critical flaw. And they fixed the error message by removing SSL altogether. So with two minutes to go, let me sum up. Are we screwed? Yes, we are. Are there any questions? Here's the attribution for a couple of the pictures I used, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Paul. All right, this brings us to the end of day one of our conference. See you guys tomorrow at 8 a.m.